What does centenarian blood test data look like in a relatively large cohort? In part one of this video series, we took a look at blood test data from the Hainan Centenarian Study, which included more than 1,700 people that had a median age of 100 years. So what about that blood test data? Well, that's what's shown here. And in part one, we looked at eight biomarkers and classified them as good based on aging and all-cause mortality data. But there's another eight biomarkers that we didn't cover. So that'll be the focus of this video, going over data for total cholesterol, LDL, red blood cells, hemoglobin, uh, MCV, the liver enzymes, AST and ALT, and HCY homocysteine. So let's jump into the data. So first, total cholesterol, TC, which in the centenarians had a uh, median value of 4.7 millimolar or 182 milligrams per deciliter. So let's put that data into context by looking at the aging related, uh, how it changes with aging. So here we're looking at total cholesterol on the y-axis plotted against age, which goes from 18 to 88 years. And this is in a study of more than 12.8 million people. So we can see that total, cholest total cholesterol levels increase for men in green and women in red. And then they decrease during aging, uh, all the way up to 88 years, as I mentioned, which is the uh, uh, oldest age for this graph. Now, to uh, get to 100 years, we'd have to do some extrapolation based on the aging-related trends. And when we do that, we can see that centenarians would be expected to have total cholesterol levels in the 170 to 180 range, which isn't too far from the Hainan centenarian data of 182 milligrams per deciliter. So from from that data, we can potentially conclude that the centenarian uh, total cholesterol data may be indicative of aged or, or, or not youthful. However, we can also see that 182 for total cholesterol can also be found in youth for both men and women as shown there. So from this data, we can conclude that age-related total cholesterol data can't be used to indicate if 182 milligrams per deciliter is aged or youthful. So what about all-cause mortality data? So that's what's shown here, and this is from the same study, and all of the studies that'll be, right, that I'll reference in this video will be in the video's description, uh, so check it out if you're interested. So this is uh, data for 75 to 99-year-olds, and we'd expect that that would have the most relevance to centenarian data for all-cause mortality risk. So first, we can see that lowest all-cause mortality risk, ACM, was present uh, in the 220 to 229 milligram per deciliter range. So when taking a look at the centenarian median total cholesterol of 182, we can see that all-cause mortality risk in green for men was not significantly increased, but it was significantly increased by 5% for women. Now note that for both men and women, there was a significant increase for all-cause mortality risk when total cholesterol uh, was lower than 170. So in terms of what's good uh, and or bad, uh, total, the centenarian total cholesterol for men may be neutral, but bad for women. So uh, can we be more specific, though, by looking at centenarian levels of LDL? And that's important because in part one of this video series, we looked at HDL and triglycerides. Triglycerides can be used as a proxy for VLDL. So all that's left for that total cholesterol story is LDL. So how does that look in the centenarian data? So the median LDL for the high non-centenarians was 2.8 millimolar, which is equivalent to 108 milligrams per deciliter. So context, let's have a look at aging-related data. That's what's shown here. Average LDL from 18 to 88 years, and this is in a study of more than 14.8, approaching 14.9 people. So similar to the total cholesterol story, once again, we can see that H, uh, LDL sorry, increases for both men in green, women in red, and then it decreases during aging. So to get to 100 years, we'll have to do some uh, a little bit of extrapolation based on the aging-related trends. And when we do that, it isn't a far stretch to see that the centenarians would be expected to have a uh, LDL uh, somewhere in the 100 to 110 milligrams per deciliter range, which is pretty close to uh, what we'd expect for the centenarians. So is that indicative of aged values? Now, it, uh, maybe not, because we can also see 108 can be placed on these curves for both men, again, in green and women in red. So from this data, we can conclude that age-related data for HDL can't be used to indicate if that 108 is aged or youthful. So what about all-cause mortality risk? And again, this is data from the same study. Unfortunately, in this study, they didn't break it down by age group. So this is for the whole cohort that included that wide age range. But all of these, uh, well, this uh, association was adjusted for age and other variables, as we'll see in a minute. So it should be OK. So in terms of all-cause mortality risk, lowest risk was present in the 120 to 180 milligram per deciliter range for LDL. And when we put the centenarian data into context for, uh, of 108, we can see that it's not in the lowest risk range. It's a little, bit of, a little bit above that going in the wrong direction. 
And considering the age-related trends for LDL, we can posit that this is actually going in the wrong direction as we expect the LDL to further uh, decrease for people that live longer than 100 years. So in terms of what's good and or bad, from this we can conclude that they have suboptimal LDL, a little bit away from the optimal but not optimal, which is going in the wrong direction. That's why I've uh, put it down as leaning towards bad. Now note that this model was adjusted for many variables uh, as included there, but it wasn't uh, adjusted for malnutrition, which has been defined in some studies as low albumin and low lymphocytes. And that's potentially important because in studies that relatively low LDL, less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, is associated with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease mortality and all-cause mortality risk, uh, it, it may be because of malnutrition. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a future video, so stay tuned for that. So moving along, red blood cells, RBCs, uh, median value was 4.2 trillion red blood cells per, per liter. So let's put that data into context, and that's what's shown here by looking at the aging-related data for red blood cells all the way up to 95 years old in this study. So we can see that red blood cells decline during aging with values of about 4.8 in men in green and about 4.3 in youth for women in blue that uh, then decline during aging that reach about 3.9 uh, a trillion red blood cells per liter uh, for uh, 95 to 100 year old. So putting the centenarian, high non-centenarian data into perspective well, with their data of 4.2, we can see that for, uh, for men, it could be indicative of a 70 year old, what we'd expect to see in a 70 year old, but also it could be found in, in around a 20 year old for a woman. Also, uh, it could be found somewhere in the 50 to 60 year range. As you can see, that curve for the women comes very close to 4.2. So from this, we can conclude that the red blood cell levels for the high non-centenarians are up to 30 to 80 years younger than expected based on their 100-year chronological age. So in terms of what's good, we see uh, that these centenarians have relatively youthful red blood cells. However, other red blood cell related measures are not good. And starting uh, that story off with hemoglobin. Uh, centenary median values were 92.9 grams per liter and converting that into grams per deciliter, it's 9.29. So that uh, value is important, 9.29, because we can see that all-cause mortality risk is posted there. When the reference was defined as 14 to 14.9, we can see that men that had uh, hemoglobin levels less than 13 was associated with a, about a 50% increased all-cause mortality risk. So we're off to a bad start there for the centenarians based on hemoglobin. So what about data for women? So when compared with the reference of 12 to 12.9 grams per deciliter for hemoglobin, we can see that values less than 11, which these centenarians had, uh, this was associated with an all-cause mortality risk and increased risk uh, for women in this study. So in terms of what's bad, we can conclude that these centenarians potentially have unhealthy levels of hemoglobin. Now next up on the red blood cell related measures is the mean corpuscular volume, uh, otherwise known as the MCV, and that's essentially a measure of the size of red blood cells. Small red blood cells can only carry a small volume, whereas larger red blood cells carry a larger volume. And the centenary median data in this study was 120 femtoliters FL as the units. So the MCV increases during aging, as we can see in this plot here. So when going from 20 to up to 100 years old, we can see that MCV increases during, uh, for men from values of about 86 uh, femtoliters in youth, 20 to 30 years old, up to 91. Similarly in women, values around 87 increased to about 89 years as these people approached 100 years. So when considering the centenarian data of 120 and the, the aging related data, which is shown there, an MCV of 86 to 87 would be considered youthful in men and women respectively. We can see that these centenarians have a much larger red blood cell and a larger volume. So with an MCV of 120 as shown there. So what's the consequence of having an, a higher MCV? So to evaluate that, we can look at all cause mortality risk as shown here for both men on the top and women on the bottom. And for some reason, in this study, they used the second quartile. They defined that as the reference. I don't know why they didn't look at uh, relatively lower values uh, in the first quartile as the reference. But nonetheless, using the second quartile as the reference with somewhat higher MCVs that are a little bit aged, if you look at the aging-related trends on the left. So the second quartile in men was 90.5 to 93% for men and 89.2 to 91.6. And when compared with those values, people in the fourth quartile that had MCVs of greater than 95.8 for men and greater than 94.2 for women, that was associated with significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. Now note that these centenarians had MCVs, uh, a median MCV of 120. So that would most definitely put them in the fourth quartile. And from that, we can conclude that their MCV was quote unquote bad as they had aged and unhealthy levels of MCV.
All right, next up are two mostly liver enzymes as they're found in other tissues, but they're found primarily uh, in the liver. AST, aspartate aminotransferase, and ALT, alanine aminotransferase. So let's put these data into perspective by looking at all-cause mortality risk, which, which is shown here for AST on the top and ALT on the bottom. And this is data from a study of more than 16.6 million people. So first, looking at the centenary median AST of 21.3, that would put them into Q2, which has a similar median value of 21. And when compared with the reference, which was defined as a relatively lower ASTs of 20 or less, um, these centenarian AST would be the lowest all-cause mortality risk. So what about ALT? So when we look at their ALT of 10.6, that would put them into Q1, that had a median value of 15. But note that for ALT, uh, relatively higher values, somewhere in the 18 to 22 uh, range, were associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So from this, we can conclude that these centenarians have an increased all-cause mortality risk based on their ALT levels. So now we've got one biomarker going in the right direction, AST, and one going in the wrong direction, ALT. So how can we make sense of that? And one way is to look at the ratio between AST to ALT, which may provide more, uh, more value, more informative value. And that's what we can see here. We're looking at all-cause mortality with survival rate and percentage on the y-axis plotted against a 10-year, up to 10-year follow-up period, starting from the baseline assessment of AST and ALT. And what we can see is that for people that had a low AST to ALT ratio, which, which had an average of 1.02, people that had higher ratios, which with an average of 1.83 in this study, the, the higher a, uh, AST to ALT ratio was associated significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. Note that the centenarians had a median AST to ALT of 2. So that would put them at a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk based on their AST and a uh, ratio of AST to ALT. So then in terms of what's bad, their AST to ALT ratio uh, is bad going in the wrong direction. All right, next up is homocysteine, HCY. So let's put that data into perspective in terms of aging. So homocysteine levels increase during aging. First, as shown here, homocysteine on the y-axis, plasma levels. Uh, plotted against age from 40 to 67 years. And we can see that homocysteine for both men and women increased during that age range. So what about older than 67 as we want to get uh, as close as we can to centenarian uh, data in order to put it into perspective. So that's shown here. Again, looking at uh, plasma levels of homocysteine on the y-axis. And now we've got uh, age ranges that go from 65 up to 80 plus. And once again, when looking at homocyst homocysteine data for men in the triangles and the women in the, in the squares, we can see that by the red lines, homocysteine levels increase during aging. Now, if we're going to put the centenarian data on this plot, it would be somewhere here, pretty much off the plot. The, the highest homocysteine level goes up to 19. They're at 23.1. And even with the extrapolation, we'd see that they're still way off the, off the plot, higher levels than expected for their age. So from this, we can conclude that in terms of what's bad, these centenarians have aged levels of homocysteine. So what about all-cause mortality risk? So here we're looking at a meta-analysis of six, six studies that included uh, more than 18,000 uh, participants. So in terms of uh, risk for all-cause mortality based on homocysteine, as low as possible may be optimal. As you can see, the, the risk is pretty close to one, as close as you get to zero for homocysteine. And then uh, all-cause mortality risk then uh, increases as we go to higher levels of homocysteine, up to 20 micromolar on this plot. But note that the centenarians had even higher than on the plot, 23.1. So uh, note that this is uh, at least 2.5-fold higher, even when looking at a more physiologically relevant, as I've yet to see someone who's got homocysteine levels as close to zero as possible. Somewhere in the 5 range uh, is closer to 5 to 10 is more physiologically relevant. Nonetheless, for a value of 5 for homocysteine, these centenarians would have 2.5-fold higher all-cause mortality risk when compared with that lower value. So from this, we can conclude these, uh, these centenarians have aged and unhealthy levels of homocysteine. All right, so to wrap it all up, we've now evaluated data for 16 biomarkers in the Hainan Centenarian study, and we can expand off of part one, the group that was the group of biomarkers that were what's good, including data for red blood cells and AST. But now we have other biomarkers that may be what's bad based on their aging and all-cause mortality data. So what's the importance of going over these, uh, these data for these 16 biomarkers? Well, if we understand the biochemistry and or physiology of aging, can we then optimize what's good and minimize what's bad as a strategy for longevity. That's the goal. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.